welcome to the talk disambiguation the black technology um, many people some people told me that the title is not terribly meaningful um, I'm sure that is because they don't watch enough Japanese animations <laughs> so they don't know what black technology means if you go, go Google it will tell you it's a uh, kind of technology too higher than the current society. But, okay, the talk is not about technologies. The talk is about uh, uh, controlling overloading set. Uh, when, how, and why. So, uh, why I give this talk? Um, when the C++ uh, now 14 is asking for uh, submissions, I saw, I saw a suggestion to talk about some spiny magic. Uh, my first uh, in, uh, reaction is that that's not magic. <coughs> if you watch some um, uh, something like Harry Potter, you find what magic is, right? You use some spells. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it does not. Different people use the diff same spells have different effects. But technology is not. We know how it works, and this is why the talk is here. But for some reason, some people are scared about controlling overloading sets. I copy paste this from the meeting notes, so don't come to me for disclosure. Um, and someone says, I really have needs for anything but a normal function binding. Translation, controlling over set is abnormal. But sometimes uh, the abnormal thing is not your code, it's the language. For example, this is, I, I titled this as a real world example, but that's not quite true. I just want to scare people who only uh, look at the slides. This, this is a problem we found in our unit test code. So the question is, what happens if I write this? It's a question I'm asking. <laughs> so I, I want to. Oh, OK. He says, oh, OK. So she says, it, it's a problem because you are going to reach the first uh, overload. Yes. And I think everyone agrees with that the second should be reached. And here's why. So I give, it, I give the call extremely true. The type of string literal is a character array. Then the language uh, look at the variable function set, and it says, "Let's first do arg uh, argument suggestion, which includes array to pointer conversion." I believe this step this step is already wrong. Why? Because Look at about this. Uh, look at this type. What is the possible value range of this type? Zero to some number, right? It's a pointer. This is an array. The pos and with the length, the possible r value range of this type is two hundred fifty-five or two hundred fifty-four, order thirty-three. It has nothing to do with this type, and. I don't know why there's, there's an implicit conversion to convert an array to a point. Because C. Yes, because C. All crap comes from C. Um, and it's not the worst thing. The worst thing is that this conversion is rep, uh, considered as an exact match in the standard. So, <laughs> OK. This, 
uh, we, we don't talk about uh, the conversion stuff that much. Let's move on. Um, next step, we find out that it's a pointer. And th there is another standard conversion. This, the pointer is implicitly convertible to bool. It's called Boolean conversion. I claim that that conversion is also wrong. Why? The possible value range of this type is 0 to some pretty big number. And the possible value range of bool has only two values. How can you just shrink a large range of values into two? That can't be right, right? Th this one is possible to match this one, the first, com uh, first overload. But here we, we, we have a second p p choice. What do we do with that? So the standard finds that this is a class, which is a user-defined type. So it looks at all the uh, implicit conversion constructor of this type and says, yeah, there is a user-defined conversion, which converts uh, point, uh, the character pointer to st string. But it's a user-defined conversion. All other uh, in the standard conversion sequence, all user-defined conversion comes after the standard sequence, conversion sequence. I already said. Uh, uh, so just a question. I'm wondering if standard string had a constructor which took char const. It has. Yeah. 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 If standard, if standard is strength has a constructor, to, which took to oh, you you mean okay? If the question is what if what if standard string has a uh, implicit conversion constructor which takes a reference to array type instead of this? Um, Yes. It, it, it wouldn't, the, the decay wouldn't no, it, the it would still So because of this rule, we lost the only chance we fix the problem in the class type itself. So here, three, three conversions might we do. All of them are wrong. Uh, the last one is wrong, not because of itself, just because of ordering. Okay, so this is the first step we do when see, uh, not we, I, I do, when seeing an ambiguation problem. And by the way, um, just keep this in mind. Um, we already know that when we compile that, there's no warning and the code just runs and there's no ambiguation, the language defined ambiguation problem. When I say and the ambiguous, I mean there's a gap between our understanding and what <coughs> the language understands. Okay, this is the first step. Analyze, why? Next step I'm going to do is I found a quick fix. It's not a disambiguation, but a quick fix to the problem by changing the, your input. It does not s solve the problem because if someone else writes new code, they don't have the fix. They may not have the fix, right? It, the, the problem is so not solved. But by looking for a quick fix, we know what we want to do, what is right. right? We want the second overload to be caught. After we know what is right, let's go back to judge whether the old one is right. There are a couple of answers to this question because this has something to do with the uh, meaning you want to express by invoking the, uh, the original code. So it might be a case uh, you, as you can see, this is string literal, right? How you call some function with a string literal and don't expect it to be passed into some string like stu string, right? It looks like this call is valid. 
if we answer this yes, then we have a couple of options to solve it. Maybe we can just add in uh, add one overload which takes a character a uh, uh, pointer to a uh, character string. Why that work? Uh, let's go back to this. We know the stand uh, the user defined conversion is what we want, right? Only the ordering is wrong. So by adding a, uh, a overload to here, we change the we like functionally change the ordering. So that fix will uh, solve it by fix fixing uh, this conversion. And we might have other option. We can say the Boolean conversion doesn't make sense. So we kill the second Boolean conversion by yield the first, so that we yield the first uh, to the second. Because uh, we, we are going to talk about the technology used behind to achieve this. And we might answer this question to no. Why? Because as I said, it has something to do with semantics. Um, you, you see the thing I passed in is the FD5 string. You, you can't just like type a FD5 string on your keyboard and input it, right? That's, you are like predict, predict in the future. So it might be a case where you don't, we just don't want this old code to compile. And we also have a, a couple of options. We can create the overload and delete it. And we can say, oh, all those conversions doesn't make any sense. I'll just disable all kinds of conversions on this overload set. So there are many choices. Choices about the bad. Uh, but so you now you have the choices. And it might be a case you just choose one. But wait. Before you choose the choices, let's ask this question. Why those functions are good? Why they are not named differently? So that you don't have this issue, right? This question is much harder to answer to the technology questions. Because as I said, technology is not magic. You learn it and use it, and it works. But this one strongly related to, to the design of your function. So here's the plan of the talk. We try to answer the, this question, this very hard question, first. And the rest of the talk is going to focus on the technologies. And about the technologies we have, uh, we can help you find patterns of the problems we've seen so far. And I can tell you how to solve those problems patterns by patterns. Okay, so let's try answer the technology. When to overload? So overload, when we are saying that we mean, in this talk we mean functional overload, right? If you don't understand what is the function, obviously don't understand what's the overload. So let's look at what is a function. There are five, can, uh, five syntax in the C++ can invoke a function. But if you search for C++ standard for invoke, uh, there is a you know, conceptual unified form. So, If, in my understanding, a function, it, a function type depends on the parameter type and the return type, and it has a function body. When you do run this body, because it it's an execution of the function, uh, and the function call is basically passing arguments to fill in uh, those parameter types in an environment and the function runs, uh, it has a return value, which matches the return type. And we got the environment after execution. And we might also get side effects. 
Uh, any questions so far? OK, no. Uh, so we, we all know what overload function is, right? They have the same name and might go uh, in the same context. But that's a standard detail. So what is overload resolution? Overload resolution selects execution based on the argument types. The standard, uh, uh, the return type, the type itself, does not contribute to the overload resolution. But the procedure to calculate the return type might. We are going to see examples here uh, later. So this is. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh, overload resolution only depends uh, on the parameter type. The return type, the type itself, does not uh, contribute to the overload resolution. But we might have techniques that can calculate this return type. And that uh, process might change the decision of overload resolution. Yes. Exactly. Uh, okay. So that's how a overload resolution like looks like, right? We have multiple argument types, and we select execution, <laughs> and we what, uh, like what we have seen. Sometimes language gets it wrong, uh, not because the language is wrong. It might be uh, because they have a different thought from what we understand. So what is disambiguation? And, and disambiguation? Very simple. You avoid unintended executions without changing the argument types. If you change, if you um, change the input, the input types, I don't consider it a disambiguation. It does not essentially solve <coughs> the problem. But it might be a case that your code just don't compile. That's fine. Um, like, uh, like the word I chose here, it avoids unintended execution. If the program just don't compile, obviously you don't run, so it's avoided. Um, and it, we can also change it to some your intended overload. That's also disambiguation. Okay, enough to, uh, enough about uh, function and function overload and disambiguation. Let's run, try <coughs> to answer that important question: Why overload? So, this is how I see a function in C++. We are, when we are first uh, learn function in programming, we all know function is like a black box, right? You, you don't know what it does, you don't know what it executes, and this is exceptionally true for overloading res resolution. You really don't know <laughs> what he excuse. But here's what we have for a function. We have, fun we have input, which is the gray part. We have output, which is the dark blue part. <coughs> and the execution <coughs> just takes the input and gives you an output. Here is my thoughts on overloading. Function in the same overloading overload set should give symmetrically the same output. What does it mean? I mean, if two functions are overloaded, it should give the, it should provide the same functionality. Why? Let's look, look at this. Look at this picture, right? The execution is a box. You don't. You can implement a function in many different ways and takes same input, gives same output. It's just the way how you write code. That's how uh, black box is defined. That's not the 
purposely creates overloaded functions. And overloaded functions takes different argument types, right? This part still cannot be the same. Only the output we expect them to, the same, to be the same. Why? Because they are named the same. <laughs> well, if they have, di if you un if you can only understand two functions output in a different way, why name them to be the same? Exactly. I'm going to talk about that. The question is, uh, we don't have different name for constructor. <laughs> okay. So, as we said, this is my thoughts. In the same overloading set, function should be the same output. But that does not work very well. As Nico said, we have constructors. They have the same name. And we have to be overloaded. And not all constructors are doing the same thing. Although in the standard, um, most of the constructors are doing the same, the same thing. If you find the effects part of the uh, effects part of standard, you are going to find effects. A new object of is con constructed. But that's sometimes it's not the case. And sometimes we have other things does not match my hope. I have, let me raise an expression, uh, a question. What still moved us? As did it move? <laughs> Look at this. Uh, Still move. <laughs> it's an algorithm. <laughs> right? We have two overloaded functions. One calls to move, another one calls to move. One is the case, another one is an algorithm. This seems that the standard just don't like my principle. Okay, so since the language diff for, for forget about the move part. Right? Um, since the language only has one name for constructors, it turns out to be there must be a, a strong reason to require people to overload that. But if we have to overload that for doing different things, we have workarounds to solve it. But before showing the workaround, let me show you my fixed principle. Functions that may exist in the same variable function set should give semantically the same output. Um, but I don't know what variable function set means. Um, I think I should explain this anyway. So the overloaded resolution. Mm.
know how to process. As you can, you just can't see this. This is the step. Just that I should prepare this more. Um, okay, I'll just say. Um, variable functions means uh, okay. That starts from overloading resolution. Overloading resolution has two set steps. First, it finds the variable functions. You can say they are candidates that might uh, be ambiguous <laughs> for a function call, and the criteria. Here is the call and the function may accept the same number of arguments. And there is a implicit conversion sequence to each of the arguments from the call to the function signature. So sorry, I'm not calling that. No. When overloading resolution set, it has two steps. First, it finds uh, functions that might accept that call. And the criteria is, first, your, your call, like FAB, has two arguments. And your function also needs, uh, you also be, be able to accept two arguments. Uh, and the next thing is, your function parameter needs to have an implicit conversion sequence from your arguments, like your a call is FAB and your function type is char int AB needs to be, be implicitly convertible to char int. So this is what a uh, variable function means. So it, you can see, so a whole overloading set is a function with the same name, right? Uh, forget about the context. The ADL may reach other functions, but the other functions with the <coughs> same name. And the variable functions that set for a call is a subset of the overloading set that might accept that call. So I changed my hope a little bit. The functions that may e uh, exist in the set may accept that call, uh, may accept the same call. Needs uh, should give systematically the same output. So let's go back to the issues we met. First, still move. Uh, the case team one still move has uh, dedicated to accept one argument. The algorithm one accepts three. They are not going to. They will not be able to be uh, in the same same variable function set for any call, right? You can't have a call and takes <laughs> gi gives both one argument and three arguments. The next thing is about constructors. <sighs> I forgot, I can't show you the standard. <sighs> Just, um, so if you go look at the constructor of unique lock. Mm, oh, I, I can show you CPP reference. This is good. You see, unique clock has eight constructors, and many of them are not doing the same thing. If you look at the three, four, five, and they say the three locks are associated with mutex by blah blah blah, this is causes uh, gives you side effect, right? And the four does not lock. Now they have same. Uh, they have different side effects. They don't have the same output, right? But we have to overload them because they are. Constructors, and this is how standards solves it. 
we define a uh, empty class to represent a type. It is called defer lock t, try to lock t, adapt lock t. What's the purpose of these types? They can put those overloads in a different variable function sets. Although they have the same number of arguments, but um, we assume people don't have like implicit conversion to these label types. That's insane. That doesn't make sense. And we we have a, a standard has a similar tech, uh, technique to solve this, like piecewise. I don't. Uh, I think I should just show you the pair construction. You see, here there's a piecewise constructor T. What this does, uh, for the same purpose, they can put, <laughs> again, they can put this overload into a different overloading set. Because it has one more argument. And it's the same for the allocator ARG underscore T, for the same thing. Okay. So, okay. Here's how I, how I answer the question. First, try to design your function overload set as one function. Try, but you might not get it. Um, you're not going to be able to navigate every case because, uh, like the piecewise <coughs> constructivity <coughs> stuff. Um, all other arguments are parameterized, have the same number. You have the same input type. How do you it? That's, that's impossible. But we have workaround. We can yield, uh, we can change the number of inputs. If you cannot make it, make the first one, try the third one. Design a variable function set as one function. So that's a. Uh, that's the first part of this talk. We are done with um, design. Any questions so far? Okay. Yeah, about half. Now let's jump into the techniques part. The first one is not quite a disambiguation techniques but just a tool, but it's very a very important tool. Um, why it's important? Because it suddenly solves 50% of our disambiguation problems. Why? As I showed you, um, my definition of disambiguation is to avoid the unintended execution to be reached. And avoid means we can cut this off or we can change it. And this one, cuts the possibility off. Your code just don't compile. And the best part is it works with Spiny in a very nice way. Well, what Spiny is, you probably know, but we're going to talk more about it later. Uh, and if you want to remove a function from an overload sta set, never use static cursor. That's for a totally different purpose. And if you know Spiny, you probably know Spiny that it goes out to give you a hard error. Um, but as I said, design is more important than techniques. Uh, I'm going to talk about static result later. So th this technique, um, let me give you, let me see whether I can find an example. Mm, OK, there we go.
reference wrapper construction. If this one is copy constructor, no dots. The first one, um, since reference wrapper takes it error value reference t, that's what the first one does. Um, and if the t already has a const, this signature becomes const t. That's fine. Mm. Wait. What if I have a reference wrap, uh, reference wrapper of constant? Now it combines to both L value int and object of int and the literal of int, right? We can I can write code like. I prepared on my own computer. I have to say, hmm. okay. So, what about the color? English too. Mm. Maybe this. Oh, okay. Um, if we have a const ref or uh, a reference wrapper of a const reference, then I'm going to be able to capture a R value reference. Why is that a good thing? Because const t ref can extend the lifetime of the object, but const a uh, reference wrapper is not a reference. It's uh, inside is a pointer. The pointer does not extend the lifetime. So anyway, the reference wrapper is designed to capture <coughs> only L value reference, not R value ones, no matter how this T is defined here. So that is what we have, what we do. It's, it's something I'm very proud of uh, about standard. It's different from boost. Boost does not have this. What this does is it capture the R value reference, uh, R value, and delete it so that your code does not compile. You have no dangling reference just because uh, you used a const type in reference wrapper or something. So, as you can see, it's a case of use. That's uh, removing a overload <coughs> from a overload, overloading set. We, and we c this is because we consider it as illegal. The dash, uh, the equal to delete thing can be, as I said, it solves 50% of the problem. Um, it can be combined with all other techniques we are going to talk 
uh, in the rest of this talk. So here is the, the actual techniques we're going to use to solve ambiguation problems. First, the most simple one. We ha you have already seen it. Add one more overload. Here is an example. Uh, uh, do you know uh, what string view, the new string view is? Yeah, right. It's a uh, string-like class, but it has reference matics. It refers. It can uh, in be implicitly convertible from both uh, character strings and two strings. So when you're writing uh, function parameters which t might take a two string, you don't need to write both. Mm. But think about it. If I already have a function, I only have uh, th this, I only have for, uh, the first function in my old code. And just because I don't want to change the ABI of my original code, I to adapt to new API, I added a string view overload because someone might pass string view around, right? What happens? Hmm? Yes, exactly. Uh, your, your problem, yeah, yes. The answer is right. The problem is, if I only have those two uploads, um, you are not going to be able to pass a character string to that function overload set because, but lang language consider is uh, ambiguous because str str string takes that, string will also take that. It's an obvious ambiguous. And the actually really funny case of it. Look at this, right? Stu, stu2r. Almost all other functions in the standard accept both const reference to string and a character string. But this does not. When we are adding new uh, a string view overload to it, we are going to have to duplicate all those overloads twice. One for string view, one for character chart. And if you have uh, ever looked at an early version of the string view proposal, uh, when we are still trying to fix uh, adding overload to the whole standard, you're going to see this as unusual. Yeah, the both basic one. It, the good part is it does not break API. When being compiled with delete, you can delete one overload. Downside is scalability. What I mean by scalability? For each type, you have to, the first problem about scalability is for each type, you have to add one overload uh, to it. If you have multiple times types, you are, you are going to have to add multiple overloads. And Look at this. This is price pre C plus plus eleven. So you see, standard also has a uh, lot of bugs. In the old definition of two string, we have three overloads: long double, unsigned long long, long long. That it looks like that covers all because all other arithmetic types convert to them, but ambiguous. Why? Int can impl 
inflation to, to convert to both signed version and unsigned version. Here comes the scalability problem. For all those arithmetic types, you're going to have to add those overloads at the average places. And the more, more severe a scalability of problem is that not just two strings. Think about it. You have many, we have many um, uh, functions taken from C, right? We have ABS, we have lots of them. And the standard says we are going to overload for all of them. Um, hopefully, ABS does not work for unsigned types. I like it. But if one day we have long, 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 we're going to have it in every place. It looks like we need a concept for this thing and solve it in one place, right? So that is the two parts, but both sides of the, of the scalability problem of this simple solution. Capture one type. We are going to solve the problem later in this talk. And here's the next uh, technique, capture all the others. Oh, the other have been uh, this is like a capture all template. It's unspecialized. Don't, don't, oh, I think, uh, I, I hope you already read Herbstarter's old article, never, uh, never specialize function template, right? And you know why? Because uh, when doing template, uh, when doing overload resolution, only if the base template is being selected, its specialization is going to be considered. Otherwise, it's all specialization doesn't count. The normal function overloading takes a uh, priority than the specializations. Um, so, but that doesn't mean we cannot use both uh, functional overload and our specialized template together, right? When we are doing that, we got an effect. I call it uh, general specific design. You have one thing that captures all the other cases, but specific overload for each other. It also does not break API. Uh, but there is a side, e side effects. You might want this, and you might even want to make use of this, but if you don't, uh, you are not intended to use this, you're in trouble. Implicit conversions are turned off on this variable function set. For example, if you have a function which takes, a uh, function of write, takes a string, and you have a capture all at case, then your character string to stu string conversion are automatically gone. You're never going to reach that. Because the capture all case capture all the others. But when you might want uh, we might also want to make use of this side effect to disable all the implicit conversions. And we do have a use of that. Uh, let me show you. Uh, I think I don't have time to find. I, I know where those examples are, but it's not, it's not my computer. I'm going, not going to sh show you case by case. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm going to explain it. In the network um, byte ordering proposal, we have byte order conversion functions. And they are supposed to work only on bytes, right? Um, they take only unsigned integers. And what we do is we create overloads for unsigned integers, type by type, and we have a capture all case to de and delete it to disable all other implicit conversion from on any object to unsigned integers. Like if you have an uh, long, it's not going to be an con uh, implicit convert to unsigned long.
And I think, I'm not sure where the CPP reference website is updated. If you look at make, make Unique, we removed all the overloads that my gen, you might expect it to give you a, a re-specialization of the un, uh, un, Unique putter. Uh, all, both tactics we discussed before are based on effects. It's in the object you're going to talk, uh, changes overloading, it's in the arguments. But there might be a case they're not in the arguments. They're objects as your class member. How do you with that? Here's the way. Create an empty class called identity. The definition of identity is just this. Empty class. It has a type for that. What, what it does, it represents the uniqueness of the type. <coughs> There's a one-to-one map, one one mapping from your T to the type of identity. And you create an object of that and use that like shadow object to deal with overloading resolution, uh, resolution in your uh, uh, implementation. We will use this. This, this can uh, solve the problem that you don't have an object. And it has another use case, which is very important. Uh, and uh, I'm going to show you very late. <laughs> just, in, uh, just be aware, uh, one thing be aware, you need to be aware of that is, uh, in many cases, uh, if you, like, a function takes a uh, generic type t as value in your function, um, the, L val uh, L uh, the argument Adjustion like L value to R value conversion, uh, array to uh, pointer conversion, those still come in. Although they might be right, but for consistency, we often, uh, when they don't come, we have to use decay, like Nico showed. When we are taking T ref, there's no L value to R value conversion for when the function is taking reference. We need to use decay to fix that. But for this one, if you use identity, it's really identity. Um, there's no R value to con uh, R value conversion, so you have no uh, the CV qualifier of uh, of a type is not stripped out. If you have const t here, you're you're going to be able to, to be overloaded on const t, the const part of the t. That might not be the thing you want. So be aware of CV qualification, and we, but don't worry, we have. Uh, uh, type functions to remove const qualification, like remove CV, right? And we can do decay. Uh, this is the definition of uh, type function identity, and we have a proposal to standardize this. But uh, and uh, there are other use cases of this function. I don't have time to explain. But if you look at this proposal, you'll find that it's very useful. It has many other bugs of its use. Sometimes uh, the problem is not on overloading resolution. The ambiguation is caused by template argument detection. Oh. Does this work? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think I should make my and you know slides more interactive. Uh, okay. But why? <coughs> it seems that I'm just forwarding uh, the pushback call by value, and it's t in uh, it takes any type of stu vector, and it's element type, and if I do V dot pushback here, that obviously work, but this does not. Why? Because it's the element of long. This is int. The reason it works in 
the reason it works if we don't do the forwarding um, if you It looks like the function function signature is the same, right? It also takes a T, but that's not quite true. This T is not the template argument. It's not in the deduction uh, context. There's nothing to deduction because this is part of the class type. So this functional, uh, this function basically like const int reference. There's no deduction here. But if we go back, look how. Uh, Free function case, this is the template argument. It jumps into deduction. And the template argument deduction says those two t's need to be deduced to the same. And apparently, they are not the same. Fix. Ad identity shines here again. Identity, identity can disable the template argument deduction you can put the template argument deduction into non-deduced context. If you want to know why, I have uh, some reference at the end of slides. You can point to, to L STL's talk. It can also be used to uh, enforce user to pass a template argument deduction, uh, but to pass it to a uh, say template argument because it's not deduced. And if you look at the definition of stew forward, that's exactly what it does. Okay, so what we learned so far is we have um, specific uh, uh, we have solutions for many overloads. That's many specific cases, and we have ca we now have capture all case, which is general specific uh, in the interface. This one is a little bit different. It's a constrained general interface. When I say constrained, I mean this one is not constrained. You can accept any type, right? Open to the world. But this one is. And uh, by the way, this code is in C14 style. Uh, if you are still using C11, you don't have enable if t, you just have enable if, and you you're going to need the type name in front of that. That looks really ugly, but it's still kind of readable. Let's try to read it. Um, if you go look at standards, when it has a lot of wording like this, this function should not participate in overload resolution unless blah, blah, blah. For this case, it's t is not a POD type. Uh, that's if you see this in the remarks part in the standard, pretty much it mandates you to use this technique to constrain a, um, uh, a, class temp uh, a template which open to the world. But uh, I only have 20 minutes left. I can't do this. Um, what I wanted to do is I uh, do a live coding of how to write this finding. Um, but you can look it up on the CPP uh, reference website. If you go search for finding, it will bring <laughs> you to a page called finding and explain what it is and how to write it. Um, but it's OK. If you even don't know how to write a uh, create a spanning case by yourself, because in a standard library you have type traits, you have meta functions, lots of things that you can just start to use without knowing what the hell this is. And at least the common styles you might be want to use. This style, you can put the uh, spanning trigger, enable if. Uh, in the return type place because by default this class template uh, give is a 
uh, creates a type of void. And it, so if your function happens to return void, you can just put it there. And the, what's funny is, oh, I forgot to say, substitution failure is not an error. If during the substitution process of enable if t, there is an uh, error, but not hard error happens, the overload, uh, the substitution process discards this signature to others. So that is how it's called constraint. It's limited to the criteria you specified here. You only work, this function is only selected if that criteria is met, just like the standard state. The read is as this function should not participate in overload resolution until this is true. And we have lots of type predicate. Uh. So this question, mm -hmm. the enable if thing expands in essence to void if it's, if it's valid, right? Yes. So you end up having a second parameter. Yes. So in principle, you could mistakenly write code that passes in a pointer of the second parameter. Yes. That is why I always wanted to, uh, uh, the, okay. The question is, by using this style, you have one more parameter, although it's default. And user might <laughs> pass a one more parameter into it and think it's meaningful, while it's not meaningful. Um, so that is why I always prefer to use a written type form of this. But as you can see, uh, constructor has no written type. It's a place you have to use some style. May not be this, but no style is perfect. We're going to see more. Right. This is uh, style. Uh, this is style that only works for C plus plus eleven, because we say uh, not just the template uh, argument uh, uh, function parameter written type can evolve into a spinning. We also say the creation of the template argument type also do. So you can inject it here. But uh, as you can see, you always have to inject some types. It might not be the function parameter types. It might be template parameter types. But it's a little bit better. Um, uh, about last style. Um, the last style may cause this template redefinition problem. Um, but I still prefer that style. Um, because, you see, there's no, nothing more than the things I want to express inject here. What this int is, right? It's pointless. But with this, we have no name. And it's just a spiny trigger. And I can read it in English without ignoring anything. Uh, and the reason I don't worry about the template redefinition problem is that uh, this problem only comes when you use finding wrong. I will tell you other uh, better solutions to if you meet this issue. And as I said, finally is substitution failure is not an error. Substitution only happens on template. If your function is not a template, then you, if you still want to use finding, you can still do it. Just make it a template. <laughs> right. OK. Uh, that's the problem with it. You go read Eric's article about, article about it. Because uh, special member functions are dedicated to functions. You, if you write a template, it's not considered as a special member function. And the compiler might still synthesize once for you. And they, they might ambiguate finally. So, but we have a solution to that. So what's funny is how you use it, right? It's funny is a hammer. It can al solve almost all the problems. If, the p if any overloading problems cannot be solved, uh, let me say this. If you, if from your point of view, 
you might be able to disambiguate the function call. Like they have different inputs, right? And th that cannot be solved with fine. Then there's a problem with the standard, within the standard. Like we did not fail to design to the language very properly. There are some cases, but I don't want to explain. Uh, it's finally it's a hub. Because it, uh, you can use it to program the language rules. Like Gabriel said, uh, although for a different purpose, the voting like should not participate in overload resolution. Likes to say, uh, the language rules just don't work here. <laughs> Sounds like that. It's kind of scary because this is a library solution how a library solution can change the language definition, right? But that's the charming part of C++, right? As I said, Spani can be used to solve pretty much any problem. But if you really use it to solve any problem, your code is going to be really, really ugly. Like, uh, for this, uh, Ch in Chandler's talk, he says he has many ugly code, and he might uh, have to want to uh, uh, customize for each ca container type by type. And in my mind, it's not it's not the code he writes, but it's a code I write wrote. In my mind, when you say ugly and it solves the problem case by case, and you use finding, you're probably going to run into this, right? We, could, we just make all our uh, function templates, and we put spiny triggers on it, and we use uh, type functions to evaluate, see whether it's the same thing, uh, see if it's not the same thing, because we are not using any over existing overloading resolution rules here. We just create ambiguous uh, templates and program it. No, right? Don't do that. <coughs> All you need, as I said, is a identity dispatch. That's it. As we've shown, it's you, it can be used in implementation. Um, if you don't have the object, create an identity of that and use that identity in resolution, uh, overload resolution. You say, in this, this is a general case. It captures all the others. Why capture all the others? Because this is overloading. If the type, ident uh, the uniqueness of the type is the least V, then this is overload is triggered, uh, reached. This is vector. And if all others, this one jumps in. So this technique is uh, very useful. You can save lots of your things from using spanning. So try to you know use overloading resolution to so solve overloading problems. That's like saying nothing, right? But that's what we should do. You tr use spanning as the last result. Okay, pattern scene so far. We have specific only interface. Uh, general specific interface and we know how to constrain them and we I also showed you uh, an example which overloading resolution itself is better than template meta program. And in if your uh, overload set is complex enough, each base template may have uh, may choose different type of interface. But fortunately, if the base template is not ambiguated, when I say ambiguous of templates, I mean after uh, the function template partial overloading finishes, there's o one base template is selected. We'll call it uh, ambiguous in base template. So the fortunate part, if you, your uh, function template, uh, your base 
all your base templates are not ambiguous, uh, your solution, uh, uh, your overloading resolution or spanning does not jump across those base templates. They are dedicated to them. So it's a problem to function template specializations, but, but not for us. We are using these rules. And it's because uh, the overloading resolution does not jump across uh, function templates. You can treat function template as your subdomain of your design. So look at the patterns we've seen so far. Uh, specific only, general specific, constrained general specific, interface. There's one more. Multiple constraint general interface. How to solve that? You can imagine you have one or more base templates and they are ambiguous. So your overloaded resolution do jumps across those. How to solve those? How to solve this problem? Here is a refer uh, uh, to solve this. We need to look, look closer to the spanning or the thing we are going to do, template meta programming. Well, template, template meta programming is not much different from your normal programming. And it ha do have some benefits, right? It has no side effects. Uh, it's very functional. We have uh, what, uh, uh, for template map programming, you have type functions, and some of them are control flow, some of them are predicates. When I say predicates, I mean something like stu, is, underscore, in, those stan uh, in the standard, like is port, is const, is pointer. They return, they take type as their template parameter and return type, and the type is, say, integral constant. The integral constant is Boolean. That is why they are called predicate. And we have type modification and transformations, which generally uh, takes one time transforming into another, like remove CV. It removes the const uh, uh, vol uh, volatile qualifier from a type. And if you are an MPL user, you probably know there are higher order function type, uh, higher or order type functions but they don't have something in standard. We don't have MPL data structure either. And um, before jumps into it, yeah, so let's uh, um, uh, pick up the topic I raised that, uh, earlier why you should not use static assert here. Have you tried to like write this code? Code like this. And what happens here? I, I created the, this is the obvious general specific interface, right? This uh, constraint general specific. Uh, th this one. Not quite. Yeah, this is general specific interface, and you will know later why. Um, we take any type, make it make an unsigned type of it, and we have uh, our own big integer types. We want also want to, to convert it to unsigned, but it's not unsigned uh, big integer. We call it bits. So we customize this specific case. What's wrong with it? If you compile this code under libc++ and probably GCC, it actually works fine. But if you replace do make unsigned with boost makes unsigned, it gives you a, an error. Why? Oh, I forgot I can't show you the standard. Go find uh, in the standard for, go look for make unsigned. 
see the description part. There is a tiny little uh, wording at the end of the description. It says, requires. T is an integral type for email, but not bool. Requires. We don't usually see this in met function, uh, type functions. We know what he means in the uh, runtime functions. Requires a precondition, right? If you violate this, it's an undefined behavior. What happens if we put requires on type functions? Well, obvious. That's a compile-time undefined, undefined behavior. So type functions may have precondition. You're aware of that. And static assert is an approach, not mandated approach, to denote a precondition violation at runtime. So that is why you should not use it for disambiguation purpose, because it does not disambiguate. Disambiguate means we know your um, in input, uh, input is right, and we are able to add it to another. Um, this one is a precondition violation. It's for a different design purpose. And uh, you probably know it causes a hard error, uh, and hard error is not captured by spanning. And when it comes to a type function, oh, uh, of course we, okay, of course we can have uh, uh, we can add static other to make design uh, because it's designed to make those behavior uh, make those behavior uh, outside the picture. But if um, a function says it has no requirements, it's white contract, and you use static result on inside, that's very evil. That's wrong. Because you are violating a contract you establish by yourself. And we call this finally unfriendly, or just not finally friendly. It's funny, uh, not unfriendly is wrong. We will fix all those cases, definitely. Sorry, so the point mm -hmm. was that difference between standard make unsigned and loose make unsigned is that the loose is using static assert? Um, static assert for something that's is, uh, a bool or not a in, uh, an integer. Um, there's no difference between the design of boost uh, make on signed and stand stood on signed. And it, the difference only appears in implementation. And I think the library vendors should just add those static others. There's nothing wrong with the standard or, or the. It's uh, as I said, it's a contract. It established a contract. It's a part of design. And the good thing pow part about using uh, template programming here is that we have scalability. You can establish concepts and use them everywhere. You don't need to change overloads one enough to each, ever in everywhere. It sounds like one ring to rule them all. It's nice. And be great. I don't have time. Let's skip this. You, uh, you can you can find this material on Boost website. If you go search for boosting enable if there's a chapter explaining this problem. Uh, but the only thing it misses, it only shows there is a problem, but it does not explain why. Um, I, I have a proof to say this problem always happens. There's no case it does not happen. By meeting those problems, uh, uh, as I showed uh, to you uh, you before, the you have to have uh, yeah you have to have duplicate predicates to 
because uh, the problem uh, the problem is the function template the template is ambiguous. They are in the same type space, and when you are using spanning on it, you have to make the, all those constraints disjoint, which means you for like for here you have each integer. This the rest one is not going to capture all the other cases. Instead, it ambiguous. You need to make those constraints disjoint in this way, like not each integer. And if there are multiple uh, multiple characters here, you have to have all those characters repeated in your uh, in your picture. And if you don't want to see that. With if you go look at Chandler's talk, there is some uh, there is some code like uh, is and later you find enable if is not and something like that. No, don't do that. Use this. We solve it with an overload. So turn it into an overloading problem, not a spanning problem. We, as I said, those type functions create uh, a type which represents a boolean. And those type, ha those type ident identity to true and false, we call it stu true type and stu false type. So we can create an object in it, and you uh, create more implementation overloads, and the this object will automatically select based on this criteria. There is no spanning involved here. And if you have multiple criteria mixed together, s some of them make sense, some of them does not, you can just create, uh, put those criteria, create objects for each one of them, and have implementation overloads, which takes all those things. And if you find something that really doesn't make sense, I don't care, you can put dot, dot, dot here. The dot, dot, dot is not a uh, template var variable a variadic template. It's just the C dot 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 is used to ignore the arguments and it takes very low uh, precedence in, res in respect to all other overloads. So if all other all other overloads does not select is not selected like for this case, this one with the ex explicit type is selected before uh, the one you put dot dot dot. So the syntax actually fi will finally looks very nice. Last part. Last part is very short. You, uh, although this technique is very advanced, um, tag this part. I'm not going to explain what, uh, how you implement a tag this, tag this part. Um, if you go look at, uh, if, if you want to know how to do that, you can look up. Uh, there are many books and articles relates to iterator, uh, iterator category. They'll tell you how to do that. And uh, the last year, Joe has a talk about a automatic framework to create tag dispatching. That's wonderful. But I'm going to talk about some essences of tag dispatching. Why this solution work? If you look at identity, it represents property called uniqueness, right? Each type mapped to an identity is identityless. If you have type predi predicates, we map all those types into two categories, right? If we have a type function that with like three types of uh, possible written types, that's going to be interesting. And that is the essence of tag dispatching. We create a isomorphic structure of the original type. If we create uh, some structure here, and it can represent uh, some property in the original type. Like for this case, um, we say uh, T2 is implicitly convertible to V1. Uh, V2 is implicitly convertible to V1, and we create uh, all those objects of the written type of FT is, uh, is split into two categories. 
and the object do implicit convert proof to a uh, larger possible value, uh, possible width value Z. Yeah. And because they are isomorphic, we can say the original type also has this property. In that case, we say TA uh, refines B in terms of our uh, type function. This is the essence of tag dispersion, which is refinement. Um, and <coughs> hopefully, we can get concept light in a new future. And concept light support refinement based overloading resolution, so you can forget uh, what the what tag dispatching is, but since we know what refinement is, you can use it. Uh, use the same idea, but implement it with concepts. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> so, conclusion. Design overloaded function set as one function. Design by patterns, I showed you patterns. Solve them by patterns. And try to use more overload resolution to solve overload resolution problem by itself. And finally, can pretty much solve anything. You see that at the last. And I have some reference if you don't know the details or some actual materials in this talk. Questions? <coughs>